Psalm 53 verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men, to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Boy, if there was ever a passage that at reading feels like it could have been written yesterday, this passage applies. We live in an age and in a time it seems so few are seeking after God. So few desire God divine understanding but let's pray before I try to preach this this afternoon <coughs> excuse me master we love you we thank you for the presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in the house of God whether there be few or whether there be many in this building you always honor your word you are a God who keeps his word where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And Lord, I know, I feel, I sense that you are in fact and indeed in the house of the Lord today. What a shame that there are not others here to enjoy the presence of God, to feel this sweet anointing, to be raptured by the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. Lord, the Word of God is by far the most important aspect of any church service. Doesn't matter what kind of choir we've got. Doesn't matter what kind of music we've got. What kind of singers or how much talent we have. If the Word of God that comes off the pulpit is not true, if it is not anointed of the Holy Ghost, then there is little value ultimately to be gleaned from our time in the house of the Lord. But Lord, we get the most out of the preaching of the Word, for your Word declares faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Anoint today, O God, your feeble Minister, help me, Lord, to preach this word you placed in my spirit. Let me not forget to say one thing you would desire I say. And let me not speak one word out of order, not one word out of place. Let everything that is said and done bring glory and honor to the name of our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, our King, even Jesus for we ask it in that name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Many today who were once numbered amongst believers now claim to be atheist, choosing instead of faith to claim a belief in the absence of any God any creator, any divine being whatsoever. Many, especially in the LGBT community, have been so offended and wounded and off-put by fellow believers that they have chosen to follow this path. Many have allowed the actions of human beings or a set of adverse circumstances to motivate them to disavow any concept of the unseen, claiming instead to embrace full and unreservedly faith in science. While this may seem like a good idea to some, for me it is insane. The scriptures declare that only a fool 
declares, listen to me, within his heart that God does not exist. I know many people today who tell me that they now embrace atheism and I don't believe in God anymore. I don't believe God exists. I don't believe God is real. Honey, the only thing I have to say to many of these people is I'm glad that that's coming out of your mouth and not out of your heart. Amen. I know some of these people. I know some of them personally. And I know that while they may say that with their lips, deep down in their heart, they know better. But my Bible said only a fool says, listen to me, within his heart, there is no God. Oh, there are few people who have actually convinced themselves so thoroughly that when they claim they do not believe in God, they're not speaking merely from their lip, but they're speaking from their heart. And my friend, I'm here to tell you today, the Word of God, the Scriptures, declare you to be a fool. We read within Scripture of one man who endured more adversity and more infirmity than most. And yet, throughout the entirety of his trials, he refused to curse his God. Job knew that in spite of the horrors and the difficulties he faced today, listen to me, oh God was yet a reality, hallelujah, and he was in fact still in charge of all that happened to him. In Job chapter 2 verses 1 through 10, and again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So when Satan, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with. And he sat down among the ashes then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Listen now, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. <laughs> what? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Oh, I want to tell you something. Too many people want to believe God and believe in God when things are going well. 
Too many people are happy to believe in God when their life is blessed and all is lovely and they're experiencing a bunch of good things. But let adverse circumstance come their way. Let things not work out quite the way they would like them to work out. And all of a sudden, God isn't real. All of a sudden, they're not quite sure of the faith that they have professed many for decades. I'm going to tell you, I started my progressive affirming ministry in 1993. I've said this so many times, I'm sick and tired of saying it. It has been nothing but a struggle. It has been nothing but a heartache. It has been nothing but disappointment for decade after decade after decade. And yet here it is, the Lord's Day, and this preacher is still in the pulpit. Hallelujah! I'm still preaching Jesus. I'm still preaching the cross. I'm still preaching the empty tomb. I'm still preaching the ascension. I'm still preaching the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm still preaching divine healing. I'm still preaching the soon return of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because, honey, things don't have to go well for me to know that my God is real. Lord, have mercy. He's not real when things are going well and suddenly not real when things are going adversely. No, I'm kind of like Job. I understand something, good or bad, happy or sad. My God is in control of every step of my journey. The problem that I often have, Tommy, is not, <laughs> it's not in believing that God's in control. <laughs> it's in questioning why he's letting me walk the road I'm walking. And we all do that. We all question to my Lord, why in the name of heaven are you making me have to walk such a difficult path? Why in the name of God must I go down such a difficult road? You know, I've told the Lord so many times, growing up the way I grew up, oh, I wish I was one of those preachers that grew up, you know, in a preacher's home. I wish I was one of those preachers who grew up with a shouting mama and a dancing daddy, but I didn't. I had a father who was unsaved and was one of the most abusive verbally, emotionally, psychologically. He is a narcissist's narcissist. That man could make you feel so worthless it wasn't even funny and I spent my entire youth constantly constant not occasionally not not frequently constantly being made to feel that I was just a waste of human flesh I was a waste of life my brothers he did the same thing to my brothers he did the same thing to my mother. Living in that house was hell. It was so difficult. I, I, I went through my entire youth, and my entire youth was such a struggle. Every day, every morning I woke up, I literally, there were times I would wake up and I'd say, Oh, God, no. 
I was so hoping last night was going to be my last sunset. I was so hoping last night was going to be the final time that I would lay my head to rest on the pillow. I'm not trying to, to elicit pity. I'm trying to tell you, some of you folks never had to go through this kind of torment. You don't understand what I'm talking about. But you know what? There are some of you folks out there that do understand what I'm talking about. Because you've been through similar circumstances. Oh, I'm telling you, I'd wake up in the morning and think, Oh, dear Jesus, another day, another day. Oh, God, help me get through another day. I want to tell you something. If I didn't have the Holy Ghost from an early age, I can only imagine what I would be today. People that grow up in situations like I did often become so angry and that anger inside of them just builds up and builds up until finally one day it explodes and they start killing people. If not the parents that abuse them, then others who represent or look like the parents that abuse them. Oh, but thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for my relationship with God. Thank God my God is real. People who say the world would be a better place without religion. <laughs> Not my world. Not my world. Honey, you wouldn't want to know me had it not been for my walk with God. You would not want to know me if it weren't for the role that my faith has played in my life. You wouldn't want to know me if I had never had an opportunity to walk in relationship with Jesus Christ so that I could be and I could become the person that I am today. Only God knows what a holy terror I would be otherwise. I've got two brothers one of them is a helpless alcoholic. The other one looks so much like my father that when I look at him, I feel like I'm looking at my dad and, and I can't stand it. Oh, I want to tell you something. I'm no fool. I'm no fool. No matter what my circumstance, no matter what my situation, I will never be fool enough to say that God isn't real. I spent years backslid and out of church after I came out in 1989 because the church and people in the church spewed me out of their mouth. Oh, I mean, all these years, I've had people who won't talk to me anymore, people who won't even say hello. I told Tommy today, I said, you know, I've told you in the past that fundamentalists and evangelicals don't shun people like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons do. They don't use shunning as a punishment. And uh, they don't use that technique. I said, but you know what? I have to retract that statement because in recent years it has become abundantly obvious that oh yes, oh yes, Christians, many Christians do in fact use shunning as a means of expressing their disapproval for your choices and for your life. Not that your choices or your life affect them in any way whatsoever. Doesn't have an impact on them one way or the other. But they still somehow feel it necessary to sign you off and to just let you float out there. They're not willing to give you the time of day. They may not embrace shunning as an official policy, they may not go through some formal rite or ritual to shun, but they shun. I have a lady in the Church of God years ago was like an adopted mom to me. She was like, she was a type of mother that I had never had. 
and I adored her. I thought the world of her. And when she found out who I was these days and what I was doing these days about my life, and oh, all of a sudden she wanted nothing to do with me. Because after all, God's people emulate the Lord in that their love is extremely conditional. Oh, that's right. God's love is not conditional. But you want to know something, Tommy, for all the mistreatment and the abuse that I've taken at the hands of people who once were like family to me, people who were very close friends to me, many who are in fact my family members, aunts, uncles, grandparents, you name it, cousins. I'm no fool. God's still real to me. I'll never be foolish enough to blame God for the behavior of His people. Amen. Amen. When somebody commits mass murder, when somebody grabs a high-powered gun and goes out into a public place and shoots up a bunch of people, you don't immediately go for the mother or the dad and look to throw them into prison for having raised that child wrong, do you? No, because you don't blame the parents of the criminal for the crime. And yet, when it comes to the house of God, when it comes to the church of God, people just love to blame God for the conduct of his kids. You think he didn't raise them better than that? You think he didn't tell them to act better than that? You think he didn't instruct them to behave in a different way than they're behaving? Honey, read the Bible for yourself. I promise you, you will not find it telling people to act the way that many Christians act. So don't blame God for the conduct of people who claim to be God's people. First of all, the truth of the matter is the Word of God said you'll know them by their fruit. I don't care what a tree calls itself. If there are no apples on it, it's not an apple tree. Hello now. You can call yourself a Christian all day and all night. If you don't act like a Christian, if you don't behave like a Christian, if you don't conduct yourself like a Christian, got news for you. You are not a Christian. You are professing something you do not possess. You're claiming something you do not own. Mm -hmm. The very word Christian means Christ-like. Therefore, anybody can call themselves a Christian, but if they're not even trying to be like Christ, then they are no more a Christian than one of these chairs. I'm no fool. God is real to me. Oh, but then we have others who come along and say, well, my belief concerning God, my belief that there is no God, is based in science. It has nothing to do with the conduct of so-called Christians. It has nothing to do with my life circumstance or my situation. It has to do with science and God cannot be proven scientifically. And science answers every question we have. If there's anything we need to know, we can find the answer through science. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there is an arrogance in that mentality that absolutely staggers my mind. The belief, and this is a core belief of modern science, any questions we have about any topic, 
The answer can be found scientifically. That is a core belief of modern day science. Any question you have, any answer that can that needs to be found can be found through science. There is an arrogance in that belief because the reality is any human being with any brains at all should understand that there are going to be things in this life and in this world that are beyond our comprehension. But no science is so arrogant that it dares to suggest that it is capable of knowing everything. It's just a matter of finding it. The answer's there. All we have to do is find it. Well, first of all, when it comes to science, let me challenge you with this today. Just because you can offer an explanation, listen carefully, does not mean that you have found the reason. I have to laugh at science. I have to laugh at scientists. They look at some of the animals in the animal kingdom. They look at some of the creatures in the biological world. And they look at certain features. And they say, this butterfly has evolved so that it has on the end of its wing what appears to be it literally looks like the head of a snake. And it has evolved and it is, this has developed as part of, of, of evolution in order to detour those birds and those beasts that would otherwise eat this butterfly. Uh-huh, okay. thing that cracks me up about people even people who call themselves Christian they don't dare question science they don't dare think for themselves for even a moment just because you can offer an explanation listen to me does not mean that you have literally given the reason for that feature does not mean that you have offered the reason for that trait First of all, if evolution is true, I'm sorry, I, I'm full enough to believe in the beginning, God created it, the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Yes, I believe that. I don't believe that over the course of millions and millions and millions and millions of years, biological creatures somehow or another just kept spitting out trial and error and kept trying this and trying that and oh, there was so much time available that ultimately they were able to come up with a formula that worked for them and all these unique features that we find in the animal kingdom, all these unique features that we find in the world of biology all of these features are just something that transpired over the course of millions and millions and millions and millions of years. And when you say, well, I believe that these things were created and in the process of creation, there was what we refer to in the scientific world, mind you. They use the phraseology intelligent design. Meaning that these things came about because there was some form of intelligence involved in the process. It was not just a spitting and sputtering and happenstance. And the evolutionists will say to you, no, there's no intelligence involved its evolution really see here's what I don't understand I don't understand why people don't consider this for a minute 
Where is evolution without intelligence? Doesn't exist. You say, well, Pastor, what do you mean? Evolution doesn't, it doesn't rely upon any form of intelligence. Sure it does. Sure it does. Absolutely it does. How does a biological creature know to somehow develop what appears to be the head of a snake on the end of its wings? How does it know that that would deter any predator? How does it know that? How does that knowledge translate into the biological process? Where in the biological process, where, Mr. Evolutionist, where, tell me, show me, where, exactly how? In biology, exactly how? Does a creature speak to its own biology and convince its own DNA that it needs to be altered and it needs to change so that it can become something different so that it might have a better chance of survival. Because after all, evolution's based on survival of the fittest. There's only one problem. If the creature needed these features in order to survive, for millions and millions and millions of years, listen to me now, if the creature needed these features to survive for millions and millions and millions and millions of years, how did it survive for all those millions of years before that feature developed? Well, these creatures develop fur because they live in cold climates. Oh, really? That's funny because even in science that I studied in school, I was told that the Earth's climate is constantly in a state of change. I was told that the Earth has gone through a number of Ice ages. I was told that there are environments upon the earth today which were once oceans and now they're deserts. Haven't you ever heard that? But somehow, some biological creature lived somewhere over the course of millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years and in spite of the climate and the environment meaning the plant life you know the, the, the changing environment I don't mean just the weather but the environment changing over the course of millions and millions of years and it changes again and again and again it goes from warm to hot and hot to warm hot to cold and so on and so forth in spite of all these changes over the course of millions and millions and millions and millions of years these biological creatures tell me somehow or another they just kept changing to accommodate the initial environment to accommodate the initial climate oh no not the initial oh I'm wrong I'm wrong I'm sorry not the initial climate the climate they would eventually find themselves in because after all if you're going to tell me 
that an animal that exists today developed hair to keep it warm because it's it's a cold climate then you're telling me that that animal must surely have lived in a cold climate for at least the last how many millions of years but then answer me this mr scientist how far back do we have to go before the climate that animal may have lived in in a simpler form was not as cold as it is today. How many times did the environment change that that animal has existed in? How many times has the climate changed that that life form has lived in over the past 30, 40, 50 million years, billion years, how many times? There isn't enough consistency in our world to allow anything to exist for millions and millions and millions of years and the climate and the circumstances surrounding it, the environment around it, would remain consistent long enough for it to somehow, chemically, somehow, biologically decide where does that decision come from? Where does that choice come from? Where in the world, who tells the biology of that animal, you know, you need to develop what looks like the head of snakes on the end of your wings. So don't tell me that evolution does not require intelligence. It absolutely requires intelligence. Somewhere they are claiming, somewhere they are claiming, listen to me, that in a biological process, there is some form of intelligence. Every time I go to the restroom, I'm just letting out brains. Because somewhere in the biological process, there's intelligence. Do you see how stupid that is? There isn't enough consistency in the environment. There isn't enough consistency in climate for anything, anything. And then let me ask you this. There's one great scientific mind that I've read over the years. Let me tell you, the man is Jewish. He has no interest whatsoever in religion. He is not religious. He is not a religious Jew. He is a Jew by birth. He is a scientist, a brilliant man. And I've read some of his works. I've looked at a number of his videos online. And he does not embrace the notion of evolution. He says, no, I don't buy it. It doesn't work for me. He said, scientists get mad. They, they're like a club. They're like a bunch of kids in a schoolyard. If you don't believe like we do, then we're going to talk bad about you and we're going to shun you because they want everybody to be in, in agreement with, quote, the majority. They don't like anybody that questions anything or suggests anything. Now, mind you, the arguments that I've just presented to you are not arguments that this man makes. These are not arguments I've read. These are arguments that I have developed in my own little noggin over the course of many years. I said, Lord, how in the world can something start out in an environment and that environment is constantly changing, that uh, uh, that uh, ecology is constantly changing, the uh, conditions surrounding that animal or whatever are constantly changing, and yet somehow for millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years, it's consistent enough so that it can change from one thing to something completely different. No, it don't fly. It doesn't work for me. But this man, 
he's a Jew. He's not a Christian. He has no interest in religion. He has no interest whatsoever in, in supporting the notion of intelligent design from a religious perspective. But interestingly enough, he says, I'm sorry, even if we were to come up with a notion that aliens somehow or another designed us and somehow or another created us, he said, I could sooner buy that than I can buy the notion of evolution. He said, because honestly, there are signs throughout all of creation that somewhere, somehow, some intelligence was involved. One of his expertise, he's a mathematician amongst other things in the scientific world. Scientists say that the chances of all the necessary ingredients being in place at the same time, at the right time, for the Big Bang to occur, in order for all of life to stem from virtually one cell, are like one in, I can't even give the number, because it goes beyond quadrillion, it goes beyond trillions. It's one in, you know, And yet they say that somehow miraculously those odds were beaten. And therefore all of this exists strictly by chance. It all came about by chance. And evolution is a process of trial and error. Sometimes the life form would develop one feature, but that feature didn't work, so then it would develop another feature, and that feature wouldn't work. And then it would develop another feature, and that feature wouldn't work. Then why in the name of God do you think that everything you look at today, listen to me, is a finished product? It's kind of stupid, isn't it? What makes you think we've reached the end of the line and that all the features you offer explanations for? Oh, well, this was done. Evolution did this for this reason. Evolution did that for that reason. Evolution, no, 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 no. Evolution did it, guess what? Uh, two million years from now to be different because this is just one of its trials and errors. It don't know the difference. It don't know what works and what doesn't work because after all, it's just a biological process. There's no intelligence involved. Therefore, why in the world? Who's telling it? Stop! This works! You ever think about some of these things? I know Christians who are afraid to disavow evolution because they don't want to be looked upon as ignorant. They don't... Am I a science denier? No. Do I have a problem with vaccines? No. Nope. Do I have a problem with medicine? No. Nope. Do I think that even in the world of, of medicine that doctors know everything and doctors have all the answers? No. Nope. You know how many times I've gone to a doctor and the doctors looked at me and said, well, I'm not sure what it is. We can't figure out what it is. Come on now. How many times I knocked over the speaker? Don't worry about it. How many times has a doctor said that to you? I don't know. We're not sure. What? With all your scientific knowledge, with all your scientific expertise, and you can't even tell me whether I've got a flu or a bug or what? Come on now. Am I telling the truth today? Folks, I'm no fool. I'm no fool. God is real to me. I don't say that from my head. I don't say that from my lips. I say that from my heart. God exists. God is real. I have experienced enough evidence of God in my own life that it would be crazy for me to deny the reality of God. 
I've been healed in response to prayer. Go ahead and tell me it was just coincidence. I was a young man, a teenager, went on an outing with a bunch of young people from our church. The fellow who uh, hosted the outing, the man who was in charge of the youth group, lived near a pond that was frozen over. I grew up in Connecticut. It gets very, very, very cold in Connecticut. And this pond had frozen over and the city had approved for it to be ice skated on. And so we had gone there to go ice skating and at one point, I'm terrified to be on anything that I might fall off of. I don't like roller skates, and I don't like ice skates. So I was on the ice skates, but basically I'm just standing still and waiting to fall. And finally, I got tired of standing still and waiting to fall, and I decided I was going to take my skates off and put my shoes back on. And when I went to do that, I found out that the man who headed up the youth group had gone home. Now, he only lived about maybe half a mile a mile away not very far but he had gone home while my shoes were in his car but I had taken my skate off of one of my feet and it was well oh my it was down probably close to zero degrees very cold and my foot got cold and it got frozen so fast. I decided, well, maybe I should put my skate back on at least, you know, until he comes back or something, you know. And I couldn't get my skate back on my foot. And then somebody said something about, well, we could just walk down to his house, you know, and blah, blah. Long story short, I walked with one skate and one bare, not barefoot, but one foot and sock. All the way to his house by the time I got to his house my foot was hurting me so bad it was in so much pain he was an army medic he peeled the sock off of my foot had me kind of hold my foot near the fireplace for a while because my sock was frozen to my foot he peeled the sock off my foot and my toes had turned black my foot was frozen solid he said, Chuck, my God, why in the world did you do this? This is before cell phones and stuff. You know, I couldn't call him and ask him to come back. He said, why in the world did you take that skate off? He said, son, you have frostbite. He didn't tell me, but he told my mother when my mother came to get me. He told my mother, he said, Don, I'm so sorry. He said, he said I've seen frostbite like this when I was in the service. And he said, if he doesn't lose his toes, I'll be shocked. If he doesn't wind up with his toes having to be amputated. He said, and if, if, if his toes do survive and don't have to be amputated, he said the other thing that happens to appendages like toes and fingers that are frostbitten, he said they will when they finally get life back in them, they will literally shrivel up and become very twisted and very, almost look arthritic, you know, and all. And I saw pictures, I've seen pictures of people who had severe frostbite and what, it looks horrible, absolutely horrible. And he warned my mother that that may be what happened to me. I went home and that Saturday, I think that was a Friday night. That Saturday, I was in so much pain that it was mind-boggling. My, my foot hurt so bad. And I had a pain that went from my foot all the way up through the center of my thigh. Went all the way up into my about here. And it felt like somebody was shoving a spear straight up through my the base of my foot straight up through my leg. Then Sunday came. I was in so much agony and so much pain. Oh my God, my leg hurt. I couldn't walk. I was in so much pain. My foot was still frozen. Literally. I told my mother, I said, when you go to church, 
and they take prayer requests, I said, ask them to pray for me. Ask them to pray for me. I need God to touch me. Long story short, I went to bed Sunday night in agonizing pain. I woke up Monday morning as if nothing had ever happened. My foot was returned to normal. It was pink. <laughs> it was just like it had been. There was nothing wrong with it. It was as if nothing had ever happened. When I went to church the next Sunday and talked to Gordy Bleacher, the youth leader, and told him what had happened, he said, my God, that had to have been God. He said, because believe me, I know what you had. I know how severe a case of frostbite you had. You were walking around with nothing but a sock on your foot in 15, 10 degree weather for somewhere in the neighborhood of an hour or so, you know. And he said, that had to be God. I want to, that's just one. That's just one of the many times that God has come through for me. I could stand here today and I could talk for the next five days and never stop talking, telling you about miracles that I've been witness to, miracles that I have been party in. Things that God has done for me. Oh, honey, let me tell you a little secret. I'm no fool. I'm no fool. Hallelujah. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Some today are allowing themselves to make this profession that there is no God because of the conduct of others who call themselves followers of Christ and children of God. Some are making this profession because of life circumstances and situations. Some are saying this because they've convinced themselves that science offers all the answers. Well, I'm here to tell you today I profess and I proclaim that I believe God. Hallelujah. I believe God is real. I believe God is real. I believe God is real. Hallelujah. In Isaiah 55 and verse 9, the word of God said, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I may not understand the conduct of people who call themselves Christians. I may not understand my life circumstance. I may not understand my situation today. I may, I may not like it at all for that matter. But honey, it does not change my conviction that God is real. Hallelujah. Amen. Because I know I'd be a fool to think that I can understand God. That I can understand why He does things the way He does things. I've often thought, Lord, are you letting me minister to an empty church all these years so that I can die having never realized my vision having never seen what I would like to have seen never experiencing what I would like to have experienced never realizing what I would like to have realized are you doing all this so that I can go to my grave a cotton picking failure and a flop but then you're going to take all these years of preaching and teaching that I've committed to the internet, that I've committed to video, and you're going to use it to reach people after I'm gone. Are you going to wind up using my words and my ministry, my preaching and my teaching to bring revival, but it won't be in my lifetime? Is that what you're doing, Lord? Because it looks like you're sure enough not going to do anything while I'm alive to see it. But you know what? God's ways are higher than my ways. And if that's what God wants to do 
then so be it. I need to be able to accept that. I need to be able to say, even so, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Hallelujah. Because ultimately, Tommy, I don't care who gets saved or how they get saved or when they get saved, whether I'm dead or alive when God does it, just so long as he uses what I've done to accomplish the task. That's all I care about. Lastly, today the Lord, the Word of God declares in Romans 11, 33, All oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. Hallelujah. Oh, the Word of God promises all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. You know, as long as when I get to heaven, as long as the Lord's able to look at me and say, Charles, well done. Every person in Huntsville can disappoint me. Every person in Huntsville can just poop all over everything I've ever tried to do here. Every person in Dallas did, so why don't every person in Huntsville do it too? Just so long as I can hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. See, that's the problem we have. That's why people are willing to trade in their faith for atheism. Because they're not willing to work for the well done. They want to see and they want to understand and they want to know all the whys and wherefores in this life. But honey, I've got news for you today. You will never know all the whys and wherefores in this life. Amen. There will always be people who do things, people who say things. There will always be circumstances and situations that you're going to look at and question, why did they do that? Why did they say that? Why did they hurt me? Why did they have to act that way? Why did I have to experience this sickness? Why did I have to experience this hardship <coughs> or this trial? And you're going to leave this life, my friend, without ever having received the answer. But there's an old song that my aunt and uncle used to sing, and I always loved this old song. I don't need to understand. I just need to hold his hand. I don't ever have to ask the reason why. For I know he'll make a way through the night and through the day. I don't need to understand. I just need to hold his hand. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Folks, I don't know about you, but I'm no fool. Hallelujah. Amen.